uh, I've got this mic on my lapel. Every time I clear my throat, it'll probably blast your ears. I'm not, I'm not used to this, <clears throat> but we'll, we'll work with it. So, um, what I would like to do this evening is to actually demonstrate some meditation practices, very basic, and, and, and describe elementary type of types of meditation that would lead into more uh, complicated ones that might be done in masonry. Uh, those would be mindfulness and uh, an exercise called becoming the observer. Uh, mindfulness uh, was introduced by a uh, molecular biologist by the name of John Kabat-Zinn at the University of Massachusetts into the United States in the uh, late 70s, 1970s, and it's, it's inspired by Buddhism, but it is it's totally secular. He, he introduced it as a way of calming down and relaxing and tuning into your self uh, while dealing with chronic pain. Uh, doctors sent the most severe uh, uh, people with the most severe pain problems that medication alone wasn't helping. And he designed an eight-week course in which they did a 45-minute meditation every single day, a mindfulness approach. So. It was secular, it's not Buddhist, it, and it got very popular throughout the United States for controlling, uh, for, for stress uh, management, um, uh, all kinds of things. It, uh, there's thousands of studies that have been done, it's good for anxiety reduction, uh, dealing with depression, dealing with uh, addictions. Becoming the observer is a kind of uh, meditation that was introduced in the early 1900s by a psychiatrist, Italian psychiatrist, named Roberto Asagioli, who um, uh, was inspired by a Hindu yoga tradition, Raja Yoga, and designed this uh, exercise for uh, becoming more in, in tune with yourself, your inner self. And that exercise then uh, is not Hindu, it's a uh, it, it was, it's a psychological exercise. So these things, so that makes them very interesting to me because applicable to masonry so easily because masonry embraces all religious traditions, any religious tradition, and this type of meditation is not bringing some particular religion into it. It's bringing a technique into it that can be applied to Masonic practices. So we're going to do a couple of those meditations preceded by explanation in the first part of the evening. And then in the middle part, I'd like to take some time to show you quite a few writings that come from, uh, one comes from the candidate guide uh, put out by the Grand Lodge of California that is for, um, there's one for each of the three degrees. Usually a, a mason gets his candidate guide after his uh, initiation. Um, However, the Candidate Guide and the California Monitor are both available now for public sale. Uh, the term monitor in masonry usually means that what's monitorial is not secret. So this California Monitor actually has, as do all monitors, bits of Masonic ritual, the actual words of the ritual that are not part of the secret part of masonry. The Grand Lodge of California has made these to these documents available for public sale through the LA Fraternal Supply here in Los Angeles. I was based in Torrance or something. I just went online to check it out and I ordered a couple of them. And they didn't ask if I was a Mason or anything. They sell them. So this information will actually quote some from the ritual uh, to show you how it speaks of contemplation and meditation and, and as well as how the educational things from the Grand Lodge speak of it. Then later, toward the end of the evening, we'll do actual contemplations, visualizing light and visualizing certain Masonic symbols, which I will describe um, before we go into that. So these are pretty advanced, pretty complicated, these, these last ones, the, the early ones are introductory, and I will be guiding you step by step through them, so I think you'll do fine. If you uh, will be doing this eyes closed, when we meditate, and if you are uncomfortable or if something isn't feeling right to you, you're welcome to open your eyes and look around if, if that helps you at any point. So let's have definitions. Um, concentration, meditation, contemplation. Concentration, and we all know what that is, right? We all do it. Concentrate when you read a book. You concentrate when you're driving a car. Um, intentional awareness is a term we often see associated with that 
from, from the traditions I come from. Meditation, in one definition, is simply prolonged concentration. So you, by meditating regularly, you train your mind to concentrate for longer periods and to concentrate your attention where you want it to be instead of where your mind goes off or wanders off to into your emotions that flare up or thoughts that uh, you'd rather not be thinking. It, it, it's a way to become more self-regulating. <clears throat> now, I did a, as the editor of this monthly magazine, I did an issue on Masonic meditation. And in the research for that, I found that um, three things that uh, in the Masonic literature, look at Masonic magazines and books, and there'll be a, a, like an article that says, a meditation on the coming of spring. Or there'll be a, a past grandmaster, recent past grandmaster in California, John Heisner, has a book of meditations, which are just short essays on things like the, Masonic, the hat, or some other symbol, the master's hat, other symbols in masonry. So, the word meditation is often used all over the place as a secular thing. It's just used to prolong concentration. It just means that I'm going to focus my mind on this topic and I'm going to write several pages just narrowly on this one narrow topic and come out with an essay. Or I'm going to give a speech and I'm going to do that. That's meditation. That's, that's one way of thinking of what meditation is. Focused, concentrated mind. Memorizing. You probably know, if you're not a Mason, that Masons do a whole lot of their ritual work from memory, including lectures, 30-minute lectures, from memory. Memorizing requires deep concentration, going over and over those words until you've got them you know, stuck in your brain. So um, as far back as Aristotle, when there was talk about memory, Aristotle says to memorize, you have to you meditate. And he meant by that, keeping your mind focused, repeating, repeating, repeating. That was his idea of meditation. It doesn't have to do with anything spiritual in that definition. Masonic ceremonies, also I found out putting together this magazine, uh, evoke meditative states from people. There's a very beautiful uh, example where um, in Australia, the incident isn't beautiful, in Australia in maybe the 1930s, a young man who was a grand master of a great territory of Australia suddenly died unexpectedly. And all these Masons came together, hundreds of them, for a ceremony to um, commemorate his life. And when they filed into this building, this author describes how it was that they all came in and it was very solemn, being given the occasion it was. And as they all gathered together, there was just this incredible feeling of unity and harmony and a meditative state that was evoked by the ceremony itself and by the occasion itself. We find that happening, that Masonic ceremonies actually deliberately uh, create some of those states, as I will discuss later. Um, Brother Steve mentioned that I'm an officer in the Academy of Reflection, which is a body in Guthrie, Oklahoma, Scottish Rite. Um, we like to say in the Academy that in Masonry, we're often told to contemplate this symbol, contemplate that idea, but there is nowhere in Masonry where they, say, they teach you how to contemplate. How do you do that? No one tells you. No one tells you how to do that. So the, the academy was set up for that purpose. It was to support and educate brothers who are interested in learning meditation and contemplation and applying it in their Masonic life. Um, so um, I don't know if someone was waiting to come in. There's, there's seats in here. Um, so, you know, not everyone, this is not for everyone, uh, of course. The missionary just has so many places where you can put your energy or your focus, whether it's charitable work or community work or um, uh, various events that, that we sponsor. But um, this is one facet of masonry that I'm going to attempt to show you how important it is in our literature and now from the Academy of Reflection in our practice. This has been in existence since 2013. So the Academy uh, names four types of meditation. Silent sitting, uh, which um, I'm going to give you quite a bit of detail on that in a while, in a little bit. Then um, mindfulness or self-remembering. Uh, Silent sitting is just quieting the mind, 
just being in touch with the present moment, and I'll explain how that happens. This mindfulness is being aware of, of yourself and of, of your state of mind when you're walking around in the world, when you're out doing things in the world. So self-remembering was a term uh, coined by G.I. Gurdjieff, the great uh, 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 spiritual teacher from the early to mid 20th century, who um, said that we usually forget ourselves. We don't, off, we don't always remember ourselves. We're usually caught up in our jobs and our, our busy lives and running around doing whatever we do. And we, and we, we don't often uh, think of who we actually are and stay with the purpose we have in mind. And, and we're not able to do that. If we could be mindful in our everyday life, we would be able to manifest our values all the time we would be able to monitor and uh, regulate our emotional expressions a lot more than we often do. So we're going to say more about that. The third uh, type is contemplation, which is actually con contemplating something, a Masonic symbol, a part of ritual. And then there's what uh, they call in the academy self-hypnosis, which means that um, you um, say in Masonry, there are a whole lot of moral teachings in Masonry. There's a lot about the cardinal virtues, about the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. So how can you be a more, how can you have more faith or hope? How can you have more charity, which is also known as love? How do you manifest brotherly love or brotherly or human love between human beings? Um, how do you become better, a more loving person? Well, self-help hypnosis is a psychological term for that, which is to say, if you picture yourself, if you imagine yourself being a more loving person, and you're going to go into a situation, and you picture that in your mind, you kind of set yourself up or train your mind to, so that when you walk into the situation, you kind of step into that more loving self. So that's self-hypnosis. It's often used in a, a, for. for decades it's been used in the Olympics, for example, for training for the Olympics, the, uh, say a high dive uh, performance. The, they often do a whole lot of work internally, in their imagination, just imagining every step and that jump, the turns, the acrobatic turns and twists and entering the water with as little splash as possible, over and over again, in the mind. That's self-hypnosis. So when they actually physically do it, that inner training has added to their ability, that mental training, their ability to do the physical act. <clears throat> so that's applied to masonry. It it's, has a lot to do with be, your virtues, becoming a better in yourself. So chanting is an interesting thing um, in, in this uh, work. I'm going to um, have us chant periodically, maybe as we finish these different meditations. And it's, it's going to be very simple. Um, in the Academy of Reflection, they chant the word or, and it just goes like this. Oh, like that. So it's uh, that sound, uh, that word is apparently a Hebrew word, an ancient word that is about, it means the primordial light. It's found at the top of the Kabbalistic tree of life. I have to talk into my microphone, I can't gesture that much. So it's at the top of the Kabbalistic tree of life. It's the primordial light. So when you sound that sound, any kind of chanting helps you kind of relax and focus your mind because you're taking a nice deep breath and all you have to do is make a sound and it kind of helps your mind often focus and settle in. I think you'll see that. And so uh, just as if you could, let's actually do that. I want you to to sound that with me, just kind of softly. Just do it softly, it doesn't matter what it sounds like. The idea is to take a nice full breath and just easily say, oh, oh okay, together. Oh. of the primordial light that we would like to evoke by doing that. So this 
these first two um, aspects of meditation, I like to think of them as uh, simply mindfulness or self-remembering. Whether you're sitting still, being mindful means, it's like you know, if you, folks take their kids to a restaurant, they say, now mind your manners, at least in my generation, <laughs> mind your manners, kids. Mind to mind your manners, to be mindful, aware of how you are coming off to the world, of, of what, what's around you and what's within you, that's mindfulness. So, uh, and, and that's remembering yourself. So let's, so whether you're silent sitting or you're, or you're doing it while you're, say, standing in line at the bank, this is something I do, or driving, okay? If I am standing in line at the bank and um, I'm starting to get annoyed because somebody's taking too long or two of the tellers go away and I have to wait a lot longer. I'm going, ah. um, mindfulness would have me remember that I want to be calm and I want to have a pleasant day. And this little irritation I'm having isn't going to change what's going on here in the bank. So what I might want to do is take a breath and remember my intention, which is to just stay just to stay calm and just look around me and see something beautiful or positive or think some positive thought. And that's part of what's about being in the present moment. So mindfulness itself is, has four characteristics. One is being in the present moment. When we do this little meditation in a minute, the way that you'll, that works is by paying attention to our body sensations and our breathing. Because if you focus on your breathing, uh, you are in the present moment. But your body can't be in the past or future. Your mind can wander, you know, can think about the past and future, and often does, but not your body. Your body's here. So that's why we meditate or we focus on the breath as one aspect of, of mindfulness. Another thing is doing one thing at a time and knowing that you're doing it. That's a key element of this type of meditation, is one thing at a time. Now, in this life, we multitask. We need to multitask. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's not mindfulness. Mindfulness is one thing at a time. Uh, the great uh, mindfulness teacher, the Vietnamese guy, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, who is now in his 90s, he said, uh, you know, he said, he teaches, has to do, people do walking meditation, you know, we just very, walk very slowly. And you just breathe and you be very fully aware of just how your leg feels, how your foot feels. How does it feel to walk? Just to take a step, one step, and then another step, and just be present to that. You know, what is that like? It's living your life in your own body. What a concept, right? And he says, you know, the miracle is not, the, the miracle is not walking on water. The miracle is walking and knowing that you're walking. Uh, the other principle of mindfulness is keeping your attention on your intention. When I'm standing in that line of the bank, my intention is to have a pleasant, relaxed, easy day. If I, my attention wanders off to what the tellers are doing, or what that person had of me in the in line is doing, or it goes into my own irritation. I don't like this. That um, my attention has gone away from my intention for the day, so I bring it back, and that's the way that meditation. That's where you train the mind in meditation. Is con when your mind wanders off, bring it back to your intention. Regular practice is a really important aspect of meditation. You get a lot more out of five to ten minutes practice three times a week than out of one hour, one day a week. A lot better the other way. It's a, it's a skill. Meditation is a skill in which you're training your mind to do what you want it to do and focus where you want it to focus. So, a very, the biggest uh, problem for pr almost every meditator is distraction. If you want to train your mind to stay on a certain thing, to focus on a Masonic symbol, or to focus on staying relaxed, or whatever it is, sometimes your mind is going to wander. They're all kind of distractions for all of us. So 
Um, people sometimes think that, you know, if, you, if you're good at meditating, you're just in this peaceful, blissful state. It's not true. Uh, uh, it, what is more true is that um, if you have the practice of constantly bringing your mind back to your intention, which is to whatever it is, stay relaxed or do the, read this book or whatever it is, uh, if, you, if you build that practice, then you can, the distractions diminish, they gradually really diminish. So distractions, as you'll probably know this tonight, can be uh, uh, body sensation, could be a pain or an or a itch, it could be sleepiness, boredom, uh, it could be your thoughts go wandering off to something. The minute you notice that, that there's a distraction, gently and kindly bring it back to the moment in the exercise that you're supposed to be on. Right now I'm supposed to be paying attention to my breathing, or right now I'm supposed to be focusing, uh, visualizing this Masonic symbol or whatever. So that's the practice of meditations, bringing it back every time when the, when the mind goes off until little by little, over time, if you practice regularly, you learn to stay where you want to be much more of the time. Uh, one last thing I'll say about it before the first exercise is that um, this is a, a lifetime work. You know, this is not easy. And uh, you get gradually better, I think, at self-regulation and doing, fulfilling your own goals and your own intentions. But it, it, it's, not, it's not easy, and it's easy to, to, um, to think, you know, that you're not doing well just because you're not 100%. But, you know, Masons say that we're trying to go from a, that rough stone to a perfect stone, rough asher to a perfect asher, will never be perfect, right? So it's just, it's a process. And my mindfulness teacher used to say something really interesting to me after he's practiced for many, many years. His kids were about 10 and 11 years old, and he said his kids uh, would say, Dad, how can, you be, how can you get so irritated? You get so annoyed with us, and you know, you meditate every single day. Aren't you supposed to be peaceful and relaxed? And he said, if I didn't meditate every single day, I'd be homicidal. <laughs> So um, we're going to practice mindfulness, sit, silent sitting. And to do that, to do that, to do that excuse me, I'm trying to talk with ice in my mouth, it doesn't work, believe me. Um, this man is sitting, you know, kind of rigidly up on the edge of the chair. I recommend sitting back in the chair. Sitting up straight is good because it keeps, it helps you to stay awake for one thing. There's other distractions sometimes in the room is sometimes snoring. It happens. <laughs> so I recommend, you know, sitting up straight and then just relaxing back into your chair. So you're sitting back comfortably, settling down onto this chair. And I'd like you to close your eyes if you're comfortable with that. If you'd rather not, you can look down at the floor way out in front of you. That's acceptable, but if closing the eyes, one, last, one less distraction, the outer world. And let's focus on the feelings in our bodies as we sit here. Noticing that as, we, as I sit here in this chair, I'll say these words and you can think them to yourself if you like. So sitting in this chair, I feel pressure my, where my body is contacting this chair. The sensation of pressure perhaps on my buttocks, the back of my thighs, my lower back, if my arms are resting on these wooden arms of the chair, I feel some pressure of gravity pulling me down, holding my arms down onto this wooden arm. And just settling down, quieting down, and focusing on keeping our attention on this and sensations of pressure on the body, sitting here in this chair as we settle down and relax. If you need to make any adjustments in your body to feel more comfortable, you can move a little bit and then just settle down, surrendering your weight to the pull of gravity, letting this chair, trusting this chair to support you fully, letting go, relaxing, settling down, and 
keeping our attention on the sensations of pressure wherever we feel them. Contacting this chair right here, sitting here together in this room, in this chair, relaxing. We might notice the sensation of air on our skin. So now we're shifting our attention. Our intention is to place our attention on any sensations we notice of air on our skin. If you don't notice any sensations, that's okay too. Just keep your focus there for this moment. Relax. And now I'd like you to put your attention on any movements in your body as you breathe. Probably notice some movement in your belly as you breathe, in your chest, and probably some in your back. <clears throat> so let's focus our attention on the movement of our body as we breathe and relax. And let's take in our own time, one nice, full, easy breath, deeply in and then out. Just let it come in slowly and fully, and just let it right back out again, relaxing even more as you exhale. And do that a second time and a third time. Just a slow, easy breath in and relaxing as you exhale. And as we've spoken about earlier, if your mind wanders, if something distracts you, just simply bring it back to the point in the exercise right now, observing movement of the body as we breathe. And relax. Just uh, be aware of sitting here together in this group. As we feel ready, we can gently open our eyes. So hopefully that gives you a taste of silent sitting. So far as I know, there are only two books, and they're recent books, on contemplation in Freemasonry. This one is the most recent one. Kirk McNulty is a, a retired, I think, from Masonry at this point. He's uh, been very active in Masonry, both in the United States and England. And this book that came out uh, last year. And this book is by Chuck Dunning, who's the head of the Academy of Reflection, uh, he wrote anonymously a big portion of this book. This, this is all applied to uh, going into a Masonic Lodge and all the different aspects of a Masonic Lodge, uh, every aspect of it, applying contemplative practice no matter what you're doing. And I think it could apply this if you're going into any group you belong to, 
uh, particularly if it's a, a religious group of some kind, I think it would, would really uh, be useful. And so you can find this online, that is, which gives, tells a lot of the story, or you can find this on Amazon or wherever. But he says in the book, besides giving tons of techniques, that um, we need to have a model of what the human being is or what the psyche is. And he says our personality is, is, has three parts to it, physical, emotional, and mental. Sounds pretty obvious. But then beyond that, or within that, there is a deeper level of identity, which is yourself. It's the, the you that does the thinking, that uses your mind to think, that feels your emotions, that chooses to express them or suppress them, that chooses to have you go walking around or sit down or get in bed to go to sleep. So there's something deeper than your thoughts and your feelings and your emotions. And beyond that, there's a spiritual part of us which there's a spark of the divine in each of us, which we'll get into the ways that masonry uh, talks about that in a while. But for now, this model is presented because it's the basis for uh, the next meditation we're going to do. Sometimes it's thought of as a hierarchy like this, um, mind over matter and that sort of thing. Sometimes you could think of it as the body is out toward the external world. The world of the senses is right out here. As I go inside myself, my, my feelings and my thoughts are inside of me, and my innermost self is deep inside me, and my spiritual self is even deeper inside of me. So this meditation is about becoming that self, that observing inner self. So we have this definition of meditation, and there's an idea that our personal self is that part of us that is aware of all our thoughts, all our feelings, that can observe it all. And this is what um, I would like us to practice right now. This is more of a uh, set of affirmations or a set of statements. It's more of a series of thoughts. It's not so much just simple focus on breath. Another very basic kind of meditation, I think, for um, uh, self-regulation, for uh, self-improvement and the ways that you would like to improve yourself in the world. So again, we'll do get into a position for silent sitting. Silent sitting is the basis of this. And I would, so I'd have you make any adjustment you need to be comfortable, sitting up straight, but then settling back, relaxing back, settling down onto this chair. And taking a moment with a nice full breath to just feel your body settling down and as you exhale, relaxing. Feeling your body surrendering to the pull of gravity, allowing this chair to fully support you. Feeling the contact with the chair, the sensations of pressure as you settle down and relax onto this chair calming down, relaxing, focusing our attention on the most simple thing, which is how the body feels, contacting this chair. And turning our attention to breathing awareness again, to the sensation of movement in our body as we breathe. Moving our attention to just notice movement of the body, any movement, to the belly, the chest, the back, and relaxing. And as another way of noticing the breath, let's put our attention right near the tip of our nose where the air goes in and out. You'll notice as the air comes in, it's a little bit cool. And it's warmed up by the lungs, so when it comes out, it's a little bit warmer. So now our attention, our intention, is to keep our attention right there near the tip of the nose. And just notice the temperature change as the air moves in and then out. Relaxing.
keeping our focus on that temperature change with the air moving in and out. If the mind wanders, gently bringing it back every time. Now I'm going to say a whole set of words out loud. You can think them to yourself or just follow, or say them silently to yourself if you wish, or just follow along. I have a body, but I'm more than this body. I am the one who is aware. My body may be rested or tired, tense or relaxed, active or quiet, but it's not myself. I have a body, but I'm more than this body. I am the one who is aware. I have emotions, but I'm more than any particular emotion. In the course of the day, I can have quite a range of emotions, happy, sad, anxious, calm, hopeful, discouraged. I have emotions, but I'm more than any particular emotion. I am the one who is aware. My emotions just come up spontaneously, but I can choose to express them or suppress them. I am the one who is aware. I have an intellect or a thinking mind, but I'm not my thoughts. I am the thinker. I am the one who is aware of all my thoughts. I can observe my beliefs, my attitudes. Some of them have changed over the years. I have these beliefs, these ideas about myself and the world. I have these thoughts, but I am more than that. I am the one who is aware. And now, let's return to that simple feeling of being aware of the body sitting here in this chair in this group. And as we feel ready, we can gently open our eyes. So hopefully we have time to discuss some of these things a bit later, but I'd like to move in now to talking more about how contemplation and meditation is uh, described or addressed in masonry, which will lead into contemplating Masonic symbols toward the, toward the end of the hour. Here is a long quote from Albert Mackey's encyclopedia. Brother Mackey was a great author from the 1800s who wrote this Masonic encyclopedia, if you don't know about it, and contemplative is an entry in the encyclopedia. Now, I'm not going to be reading hardly any of this word for word. I put it up there so you can read it. But I would like to make a couple of comments on it. You know, so he's saying that, that, that the, uh, the sage or the priest or whatever would mark out a portion of the sky to, to focus on, right? So here you have the whole 
uh, canopy of heaven here with, with zillions of stars, and you can't take that all in. So contemplation is taking one piece of it. That's what contemplation is in masonry. You're thinking you've got a lecture of the first degree, and it takes 30 minutes to give the full form of that lecture, and you hear, and then that whole first degree, you hear about, and you see by the actions and by the various things that happen, 30 or 40 symbols. It's like the star decked heaven. Contem to contemplate the first degree is to take one of those and take a little time with that. So Mackey says this very interesting thing at the end. Speculative is the equivalent of contemplative. Now, you know, we make the distinction in masonry that operative masons are the stone masons. We're the speculative masons. We're philosophical. We're, we use our minds to, to uh, and see all the tools and symbols. So we're speculative masons. And he says it means contemplative. Here's why it means contemplative. Because that was the definition of speculation when the earliest uh, documents from the stonemasons that inspired modern masonry were created. So here you are in the late 1300s. Speculation was actually that, well, it's, it's like philosophical uh, thinking. You know, it's, and it's, it's staying with something, just like what I've been saying all along. So speculative masonry, in a way, is contemplative masonry by that definition. So when you get toward the late 14th century and start coming into the 1400s, you start seeing uh, the old charges, which were the constitutions, the Gothic constitutions. The old stonemasons had these books of constitutions, simple, they weren't too long, that uh, talked about a kind of mythical history of masonry, where we came from, how it, we came down, in some cases we came down from Adam, and, and there was Noah, and there was Solomon, who was a, a grand master mason, and so on. So we have all this mythical history that is allegory, that explains what our, our philosophical masonry is all about. And the word speculation came up in one of the, there were two very early old charges that, that eventually all these old charges were studied by James Anderson in the early 1700s, and he wrote the Constitution, Constitutions published in 1723 that became the Constitutions that we go by today as far as you know, how you hold meetings and what, are, what the history of Masonry is, what the mythology, what the story, the mythical story is of the evolution of Masonry that we take as an allegory and which we uh, learn from. This is hard to read, and I, and, but it's, this is a page out of that old book. And what this is saying really is that there was a, the first king of all England, who was Athelstan or Athelstone, uh, around the 1900, 900s AD, early 900s AD. And he had a son named Edwin. Now, historically, we can't prove that. We don't know that he had a son or even maybe a brother, maybe not, named Edwin. So that tells you this is an allegory. Uh, it's a story in masonry that's there to tell us something about masonry. And this is really saying, really, that a prince was very interested in geometry. He loved masons. And masons used geometry, the, the master architect masons used geometry to design buildings, which was then rebuilt by the stone masons. So Prince Edwin became a mason. But he wasn't out there using stones and mortar. He was studying the, the tools and the, and the philosophy of masonry and geometry, the science behind masonry. So he was a speculative mason. So that goes all the way back to early 1400s that idea. And I said, James Anderson, when he wrote the Constitutions, a lot of which we go by to this day, um, he uh, uh, took this, wrote this about how you act when you're in the lodge. And it, it didn't talk about contemplating, per se, but it talked about being solemn and reverent and considering the lodge as a sacred space, as a place of worship. You know, behavior, don't be, behave ludicrously or jestingly when you're in lodge. It's, it's serious, it's solemn. But don't use, get those uh, letters that are or an S in modern English, use any unbecoming language. Pay due reverence to your master, the wardens and the fellows. Put them to worship. This is saying that 
And you get into a Masonic Lodge room, it's a sacred space. Later in the century, late in the, in the 1700s, you get uh, William Preston, who is the, the genius mason who is, has written most of what is now the modern ritual. He wrote lectures. He, he wrote full-blown Masonic lectures. And the wording of the lectures he wrote, much of that is identical to the wording we still use to this day. So he is one of the greatest influence, influences on our craft. And he talks about the opening ceremony in the lodge being conducted in a way that it moves you into a contemplative state. And he probably wrote most of that. So he's saying, I wrote this so you guys, when you sit there, you would acknowledge you're in a sacred space and you would, your mind would get into a sacred mode, a reverent mode, when a, when a Masonic meeting opens. And paying homage to the, to the uh, officers. The three officers in the lodge sit in the east, the uh, master of the lodge, and then the senior warden of the lodge in the west, and the junior warden in the south. And they are representative of the great, great qualities, divine qualities of wisdom, of strength, and of beauty. The wisdom of the Lord, if you will. Strength, beauty. So when you, when you have awe or reverence, toward, it's not just toward the officers, but it's toward what they represent. And because there's an opening prayer, and there's that light. You see the letter G lit up on the, to your right up there in the east. Um, standing for God in one of its definitions. Uh, so the light in the east, you, you, the prayer evokes uh, the deity and makes, you, uh, makes your mind open to that. So now you're talking about a type of contemplation or a meditative state that is spiritual. And this is a tracing board that represents a lot of that. Tracing boards were uh, symbolic diagrams that I wish I still had them in the United States. And, and I was in England in March, and they have all three tracing boards, one for each of the three degrees. This is the first degree. These are all the basic symbols of the first degree. These three great pillars I was just talking about, we're looking toward the east, so this, the blazing stars, that letter G represents that, right? Then you have, in the east, this great pillar, which is the master of the lodge, which, which he stands for wisdom. And then you go all the way over here to the west, and you have, because you're looking at toward the east in this diagram, right? So here's, in this tracing board, you have a kind of a scene of what might be evoked in William Preston's idea of what happens when you say these prayers, when you venerate the officers of the lodge. They're like these giant pillars that are just way beyond the room. This is a symbol of something, of a vast divine quality that comes into this room of this lodge beauty here, wisdom here, strength there. Uh, we'll get more into that later. But in England, they have uh, these tracing boards that they use for each of the three degrees to give their lecture with a, right there, it's a visual aid. You know, we've dispensed with them here in the United States. I hope, it, I hope they come back someday. But, it, but you can look how similar this is. Kirk McNulty, who, who, I, who wrote that book on contemplation that was done in 2018, he writes a lot about how the lodge is symbolic of our inner psyche. So in our psyche, he's saying, there's a light inside you, which is symbolized by a light above the head, which is uh, symbolic of your having a divine spark within you. In Masonry, we say, we say that we are all children of one almighty parent. So if we in this room are all children of one almighty parent, we are brothers and sisters. We are to love one another. So this is a symbol that is the symbol of light above the head, which is a symbol of that higher perspective and spiritual perspective that you can attain to through meditation. And we're going to do that right now and then move on to, uh, I'll, t I'll show you different ways in which uh, the literature of masonry uh, points toward meditation and contemplation. So I would have you go through the drill now. So you, you, you get into a, a proper position where you're sitting up straight, get comfortable, but 
First of all, sit up straight and just settle back onto the chair. Relaxing, closing your eyes. And becoming aware of how your body feels, contacting this chair, settling down, relaxing. Inviting relaxation to, in every part of your body, just settling down, calming down. And becoming aware of the movement of your breath. And with each breath, as you exhale, relaxing even more. Taking a couple of nice, full, easy breaths to help accomplish that. Getting relaxed and comfortable and focused. In this case, focused on the movement you feel in your body as you take these breaths. And we'll shift our attention to the air moving in and out the nose for a moment. Once again, helping ourselves to hold our attention where we want it to be. Right now, let's keep it where that column of air moves in and out so we can notice that temperature change right there. Relaxing. I'd like you to imagine now that about two feet above your head is a miniature sun, a brilliant point of light like a miniature sun, very gently shining down all around you and all through you. It's very gentle, calming, comforting light. You might actually see it in your mind's eye. You might see a brilliant point of light up there over your head or just assume it's there. It's there. And it's very comforting and calming. And we hold our attention on that light. And we just take the time to have a little kind of sun bath as we sit here in this beautiful, calming, comforting, light. You can imagine this light shining all the way th all through our body as it comes from above, filling every cell, every, every part of our body with loving, comforting light, and surrounding our body, just a nice glow, calming, healthy glow all around the body. And we sit in the light, breathing in the light. Again, I'd like us to return now to simple body awareness. You can release this imagery of the light, coming back to just a sense of sitting here in this chair, here in this group. And as you feel ready, you can gently open your eyes.
So, the light in masonry has many meanings. Truth, knowledge, gaining knowledge. Um, a point of light, like the sun, can symbolize, well, the sun, you know, is the source of all life and light for our planet. So it's the source, the ultimate source of life and light. And the um, sun, when it comes up every day, doesn't make any decision about who it's going to shine on, right? It symbolizes unconditional love. It shines equally on everybody and everything. Unconditional love. So, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of little passages from, from ritual and from uh, the, this, these uh, guides that uh, speak to the issue of applying contemplation and meditation in masonry. And then we'll close with a rather longer meditation using the light and using the symbol of these uh, pillars of, of wisdom, strength, and beauty that are part of the Masonic symbolism we saw in that tracing board. So this little book, that I says, L.A. Fraternal Supply, if you're interested in it, um, sells these things. So here's what it says for, for, for candidates uh, to Freemasonry, or those who have actually gone through their first degree of masonry. So, Grand Lodge is saying, you need to meditate on these symbols that you've been exposed to here. So there's the essence, there's the one line from that long quote. So we're encouraged to do that as Masons, it's just that it's only since the Academy of Reflection that we kind of have a method and a means to, and, and a support group, so to speak, of folks who are Masons who want to do that in Masonry. And this is very important, the time between degrees, because, you know, uh, initiation me initiate means to start something, right? So when you have an initiation, uh, you experience something, and then you're told all this stuff in one hour or so, and you, you're just starting. You have to realize that you're just starting. So that the idea is to keep, to, to take all these things that you've been told and study them and then contemplate them the ones that interest you the most. Take the one that interests you the most, focus on that. Then focus on the next one that interests you. That's how you develop as a human being who wants to grow and better yourself. And that's certainly how Masons want to do that. So contemplation is what we call wisdom-based learning, uh, which means it's the, it's the learning that comes from within yourself. Fact-based learning is hearing a lecture, uh, reading a book about something. So you can read a book about a symbol, and I would encourage that, you know. I read it. What's the history of this Masonic symbol? If you want to know the meaning of a Masonic symbol, lots of folks have written about it over the centuries, right? Go and find out what's written about it, and then sit down with that symbol and contemplate it, and you will begin to understand it in your own life and how it applies in your life. Or you might be understand it in your own way. That's wisdom-based learning. So you get insights and ideas about it that, that didn't come from this person or that person, that came from within yourself. So there's a wisdom-based learning that comes from contemplation. Masonry has a big emphasis on inner work. You know, we don't hear much about it. I'm, I'm doing this because this presentation is about the facet of the masonry that's not very well emphasized all over the place, but it's it's right there, hidden in plain sight, as they say. You know that this is what the Grand Lodge says. What happens when you enter the lodge? You're coming into a spiritual world, and the candidate for masonry is valued for his internal qualifications. This is what masonry is about. It's the inner man. And you don't you don't get there entirely by reading a book or hearing a lecture. You get there by meditating and contemplating.
Uh, so this right here is uh, from the first degree teachings. And I said early on that another word for mindfulness is self-remembering. So Masons fix in their memory these teachings about virtues and then they become a more, a more virtuous person. That's what Masons are all about, is becoming a better person, a better man. Here's a great uh, writer from uh, the uh, middle of the 20th century or so. Alan Roberts wrote a lot of books. So he describes the great hero of masonry, Hiram Abiff, you know, who was the, uh, the name is mentioned in the Bible, but in masonry he becomes a big part of our mythology as, as the, the ultimate man of integrity who holds to his values under the most difficult circumstances. And he was the architect of Solomon's temple, so he got his inspiration from going into the, a divine place and concentrating. And Robert says, we need to do the same. So we draw out a plan for our life as to becoming, as to develop morally and spiritually. So now some things that are really directly from the ritual that are monitorial, they're not secret parts of the ritual. Here's one from the first degree. So as I said at the beginning, <clears throat> we can see this, and we're told this, we as Masons, <clears throat> but until the Academy of Reflection came along, there was really, as far as I can tell, no place to uh, say, here's how you do it. Here's how you contemplate. So this is what I'm wanting to join with other people in figuring out what that is and how to do it. Second degree. So here's some symbols. <clears throat> right there on your left, at the back in the corner of those two globes, are a globe of the earth and the globe of the heavens. <clears throat> and here's what the ritual says. Very interesting. In the meditation group I lead here on Saturday mornings, which is, happens to be for Masons only, it, uh, we've done this particular contemplation. It's really something to actually do it, spend 20 minutes in a deep meditative state after you've practiced these preliminary steps we've been doing tonight for several months, months and months and months. Then you can sit there for 20 some minutes or whatever and do that. And w when we finish that, some guys will say, 20 minutes or 30 minutes. I didn't know, you know, it seemed like it went by so fast. That's what happens when you get deeply into to meditation. The Masonic apron is again, it's a reminder of being in a pure mental state to where you're more open to the divine. That's what that apron is intended for. Not too many Masons remember this when they're putting on their apron, that that apron could mean to you, oh yeah, this is the time to be move into a sacred space. You put it on out there and you come into the lodge room. You're in a sacred space now. This helps you to remember that it's time to let go of all the stuff that you think about of the outer and the everyday world to tune into something higher that symbolizes by that letter G. Again, another symbol of symbols of masonry, going from the rough ashlar to the perfect ashlar, making yourself a better man. So Masonic symbols are reminders. They make you mindful of what your goals are to for self-improvement and spiritual growth. 
So, as a closing meditation, <clears throat> we can work with these symbols that I've been speaking about and uh, represented by these three enormous pillars. So, there's a pillar of wisdom there where the master sits and a pillar of strength there where the senior warden sits and a pillar of beauty there where the uh, junior warden sits. As you can see, these are archetypes actually of, of those qualities of the divine. So you're creating a space uh, where divine qualities of strength, uh, wisdom, strength, and beauty are present there and you hold an assembly in within those sacred qualities inspiring you, as well as, above all, that light. So, <clears throat> that's what Preston was saying in effect. And here's a great brother, Wilmshurst, another a, a philosophical or a mystical mason from the early 20th century. about how Masons would ideally meet and how we actually do meet. You can really feel that in so many Masonic settings. Sorry, I don't want to stay too long on these. We've got to get to the meditation and break for dinner. So this is a Kirk McNulty, again, who wrote that first book on contemplation I showed, uh, who talks about going inward turning toward the divine. This is a spiritual practice, masonry. So to close, let's take this imagery. And I like can notice on the tracing board, see we're, we're facing the east, right? From this view of this diagram, it's facing the east, which is down to your right. And you can see that. See, there's north and south. You can just barely see there's an N and an S in there. So let's look at it in, in this actual lodge room. If you, again, uh, this, is, this is that same diagram where the east is up here, the symbolic east. But let's look at it so just as you're sitting. You're sitting right here on the, oh, this is upside down, isn't it? How did that happen? That's right. That's how we're sitting right Oh, it is right. I'm, thank you. I'm looking at it. I'm upside down. <laughs> you're not upside down. <laughs> so, all right. So you are sitting looking at the, the altar, the altar would be right behind me, and on the other side of the room is the north side, right? So, to your right is the east, there's the worshipful master's chair, that's wisdom. So let's look at it this way. So that's the symbolism from that tracing board. Those are great pillars of divine qualities that fill this room during, say, a spiritual meeting, a uh, Masonic meeting, and that's the symbolism of masonry. And then they also have the, the blazing star. It's there in the east, but if you'll notice there's a star right above my head. That's another, that's really by way of saying in a lot of, uh, uh, of literature in masonry, they'll, they'll, there's some of it, at least Albert Pike for one, they would place the blazing star right here in the center of the room, right over the altar. That's what we're gonna do, we're gonna match. So we're gonna do an elaborate visualization to close off this session. Uh, uh, based upon this idea. So, if you would, <clears throat> you know the drill, <laughs> right? And most of these steps, by the way, this is our fourth step. You had silent sitting, then you had that uh, exercise of becoming the observer, then you have the light over the head. Now you have a group, a very uh, elaborate kind of visualization any one of those you could practice for months before you move on to the next one. Some people practice the one their whole lives, and that's all they do is the silent sitting, and that's fine, that's okay. So we're gonna, I'm taking you through a lot of steps in a very short time just to give you a taste of all this. All right, so sitting in a good, comfortable position for meditation, sitting up, closing our eyes. Taking the time to take a nice full breath and to let out any tension to the extent that we can to relax and settle down onto this chair.
noticing the sensations of breathing, whether it's the movement or the temperature change at the nose. Just, I'm sitting here calming down, quieting myself down, breathing. I open my heart. I invite the light. I imagine I'm sitting in the light, breathing, the light over my head. As this light will bring enlightenment, it will bring a light, shine a light on these symbols I'm about to visualize. And sitting here in this group, we can picture or assume or imagine there's lights over each of our heads. So this is a lot of lights in this room right now over our heads, gently, gently shining down upon us, filling this room with light. And let's imagine in this room <clears throat> that we invite some qualities of the divine <clears throat> into this light. On our right, at the, that end of the room, a great pillar of light or energy of wisdom shining out into this room. That pillar is huge. It goes down into the earth, up into the heavens. The divine quality of wisdom shining into this room and into this group, bringing wisdom into our hearts and minds. Breathing. And adding to that, to our left, on that end of the room, there's a great pillar of strength. Whether it's a column of light or energy, it goes down into the earth and up into the heavens. The divine quality, divine strength filling this room, blending with wisdom in our light. And let's now imagine, whether you see it or just sense it or just assume it's there, right where, sitting along the wall, there in the very center of that wall where we're sitting, is that great pillar of beauty. The beauty, the divine beauty, the beauty of the divine nature, shining into this room, blending with strength of the divine the wisdom of the divine, these great divine qualities filling our hearts and minds, inspiring this group, wisdom, strength, beauty, And now in the very center of the room, let's imagine a brilliant point like a blazing star of light, as if we have invited the Divine Presence to come and dwell among us. The light of the Supreme Being. Breathing.
and let us begin to conclude by chanting the sound of the oar, following my lead, three times. of how we're sitting here in this chair, in this group, we can gently open our eyes. Thank you.